my name, my name is Daljit. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the channel. If this is your first time here, this is a channel that focuses on content for the Game Football Manager. Yes, I do tips, tricks, hacks, guides, and I also do live streams, but that is done on a different channel. You can check out the links here below and please join me on the show when you can. In fact, today's Game Changer episode, uh, well, it took a spin into the live stream section if you caught me um, just a few days ago. We worked on this, right? On the stream, you saw it. Bloody hell, a free shot, free kick. Shot wide, free kick. Sir, look, 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 look. This is the routine we made just now. Guys, shot wide, free kick. Remember this? I feel, man, this is a, I, I, I don't know, man, this game. This game, there's so many exploits. And uh, we were looking at the safe and then we also created a new tactic out of the blue. So I took one of your saves randomly and just made a tactic. And uh, we wanted to try different things out, right? Look for, like, create an exploit tactic, essentially, uh, with an exploit free kick routine. <laughs> and an ex, I mean, I just, I was just, I think I, I looked for three. We managed to successfully do a few. And uh, yeah. It's something I do on the channel quite a lot, right? But not here. I live stream on a different channel. So please don't forget to check me out on that channel where you can pop in, ask questions, take part in uh, tactic creation exercises, whatever. You know, we do different kinds of things on that channel. So we've uh, I've decided to split the two so that it gives more people a chance to go to different areas, right? For different kinds of content. So you get shorter form content here and you get longer form content there. Uh, we've got Liam Flanagan, who's managing Hoffenheim. Hasn't done too badly since he's taken over. Finishing second, first and second. Uh, fifth, he's in the European uh, Champions League. And he's got some interesting players at his club. So you got, you got Eduardo Camavinga and Andre Bellotti. Immediately, I'm thinking to myself, hmm, finances. We need to take a look at your finances next. <laughs> For any long-term success in Football Manager, you got to become a master at playing the financial game. First thing we're going to do is take a look at the overall balance. Now, while 127 million seems to look pretty good, it's a very slow, creepy balance. You know? like it's not moving very high. You're generally looking at about 40 million most of the time, around 40 million for your balance. And then, you know, you go out there, you try and buy and sell players, but profit and loss for last season was 11 million. Uh, and I'm, when I'm looking at the projections, profit and loss is not looking very good, right? Your balance doesn't look very good. So in the long run, you want to increase your income revenue streams. Your TV revenue alone from um, last season was only about eight million. Players sold about fifty-three million, right? So you're not you're not going to make a lot of money. Look at the season tickets, six million pounds a year, right? Even if you were to double your stadium size, you're looking at 12 million. Still not a lot, right? Merchandising gotta, is, is not too bad, but in the long run, you're gonna have to make more money. Your big money churner right now is definitely the Champions League, right? Because that's where you're making most of your money. Uh, and you're doing well in the Bundesliga. You're making money from prize money alone. That's bringing you about 190 to 100 million a season. So what you wanna be doing right now is you wanna be looking at expanding your revenue sources. And this is what I suggest. Start coming up with a plan to develop your players and sell them for profits as well. So you're looking at youth players and you're looking to develop these players and put them on the market with percentage of next sale clauses. Your aggressive transfer history in the last couple of seasons did you a world of good to push you up the table and get you into the Champions League. However, if we were to take a deeper dive into those numbers, you look at your position this season, 163 million you've spent uh, for 96 million that's gone out. And then if, as we go through the last few seasons, the story is about the same. You are spending more money bringing players in than you are recovering. Now it's time for us to take a look at other aspects of your safe. Just uh, from the first page alone, I can see that you've delegated training and you've delegated scouting to your staff. Now, while that's not a bad idea in some cases, but sometimes when you want to maximize the value you get from the game, there are times when we have to take some control over certain areas of the game. You've got a very large recruitment team. There are 21 scouts in your club. You've got some pretty good staff. 
And we're taking a look at some of the reports that have been coming in. Well, um, just uh, the players, notice one thing, 118 year old. Most of the other players, the values are pretty high. So how are you going to start making money if you've got to pay, say, 37.5 million for Jerome Anguene? And then if you're going to try and sell him off, you've got to flog him off for a big profit, right? So you want to start thinking about how you can bring in younger players who are cheaper and uh, potentially you have the ability of uh, developing them and then selling them off. I may be a moderator on the training and tactics forum, but there's one thing I love about the guys at SI. They let me speak my mind. I don't like recruitment meetings. Nope, I don't. In fact, I like to take control of scouts myself. I like to tell them exactly what to do. And I've done a guide here. It explains scouting in the simplest of terms. It's a short little video and you'll be set to you know, go out there and identify your young players that can you can groom at your club and then sell them off for big profits later. Training, Football Manager 21, no brainer. I've already done a video that explains how you can use one training schedule for an entire season. Yes, one training schedule. You don't even need an ass man for that. Okay. All you gotta do is start preseason. Maybe you let the ass man do it since you don't want to do boot camp. You don't feel like you know speaking your players suffer. Then once the season starts, switch over to my complete training schedule. I've already explained why that schedule is so good. Now, when you end up with weeks where there are three games, then just let the ass man worry about the schedule on that day. All you gotta do is make sure there's some attacking movement and maybe some, you know, maybe you wanna pop in a set piece training schedule here and there. Yeah, just do that. It's that easy. So why are you handing all these off to the assistant manager? Let's do a really simple, quick, dirty scouting guide. Step one, we take over scouting. Step two, we use 16 of these scouts. We'll keep the rest on standby. Step three, we're going to choose countries that we want to go to. Now, this is a personal preference of yours. I've done a guide on this on the Discord channel, so you guys should be able to find that. And um, you, what you want to do is you want to isolate those countries. Now, take your scouts, leave them on an ongoing basis in all these countries, right? The longer they are there, the better it will be for your scouts because they will give you those reports a lot more faster than a new scout going to a country that he's never been to. Here's an example of a filter. What you're going to do is we're going to add the countries here. You can choose whatever countries you want. I've picked one for you. It's Turkey. Then we're going to set a, the filters up for attributes, 10 natural fitness, 10 determination. Natural fitness is important because you don't want players with low natural fitness takes a hell of a long time for it to develop. And players with no natural fit, low natural fitness don't last more than 45 minutes. Then age is between 15 to 19, or you could do it like at least 19, or at most 19. And then uh, scouting potential ability should be very good. Now, scouting pool, uh, ongoing duration, and then all you got to do is start the assignment. Now, do the same thing for as many different countries as you can possibly you think of, uh, you want to send your players to, you can also do it uh, on a regional basis as well. Next, we're going to take a look at training. First stop, your staff. Looking at your staff assignments, I'm a bit concerned. Uh, basically, this entire area is two and a half or lower. So what we're going to do is we're going to ask the assistant to reassign them all slightly better now with, you know, at least possession, uh, tactical and technical. We've got three stars there. But this tells me that we need to do something here. Like, um, okay, you don't need this goalkeeping coach anymore, right? So this goalkeeping coach, you can let him go. Once this coach is gone, then you can hire another coach. The long-term plan for you has to be to improve the quality of your coaches so that your players actually develop more effectively. The next step is to look at your youth coaches, right? Your youth coaches, personality and their attributes are really important. So you want to focus on both. Ideally, I normally aim for personality first as a priority, and then I look at the attributes. And once you get these coaches in, they will influence the kind of youth players that you get through your tiers. So you want to be aiming to improve the quality of these coaches as well. Now it's time to take a quick peek at the under-19 players. All right, we're going to go to um, under-19s, go to squad. Whoa, we've got quite a few players here who have potential. So what do we do? Now, the easiest way of doing this is to just think of your main tactic. Now, you tend to stay on one tactic for the whole season. So this makes things a lot easier. Your youth players ideally have to be, end up playing the same tactic the main team is using. Most of the time, they'll be using the same tactic anyway. And then 
All you need are players to move from that system into your main team, right? So what do you do? Choose roles that your main team is using. Don't worry about the grayed out rules as well. I mean, it just means that he's missing so many attributes there. But what you can do is just uh, pick a role that the main team is using. If you're using a complete forward, just put him on as a complete forward. Take control of all individual training. And then this is the easy part. All strikers, all finishers, all attacking players, they need off-the-ball decisions, right? So all you got to do is choose uh, attacking movement or you could even choose quickness. Now, all these attributes are are viable. So I like to keep things really simple for my youth players. So I normally go quickness for most of them. You can come in here, choose quickness again, you can take control of all individual training for your forwards here. Maybe you want to just take, wow, I'm just going to give him off the ball. Uh, then for your defender over here, we've got a defender, we can give him defensive positioning. Um, and, and if this is the first time you're doing this, limit it to maybe about 10 players. Then pick the players that are really important like this player and create a note for him. Maybe you want to command K and then create a note for him and say, track the boy. And what will happen then is he pops up with a nice little yellow dot above his head. So you can start tracking the players that you want to see end up playing in the first team. When it comes to mentoring, it's really straightforward. Make sure that the right players are in the right groups, right? You don't want a defender being in the attacker's unit because the defending unit and the attacking unit are separate. So if I look quickly through this, you've got defenders here, you've got a defender here, and you've got a defender here. That's not too bad. And then we've got a mid attacking unit player here. We've got another attacking unit player here. We, we got Eduardo Kamawinga here. All right, so what we want to do is check out the unit. Make sure, making sure Eduardo Kamawinga is in the wrong unit. See this? He's in a defending unit. So if you want him to be mentoring that group, he's got to move into this unit. So you drag him across to this unit. Now what this means, and this is a reason why I like my complete training schedule. It's very balanced. It means that you can be moving players between units and it doesn't affect their training. This is the reason why you want to control training and set their roles to follow the tactic. That way, you kill two birds with one stone. Your training, you don't have to worry about moving a player from one unit to another unit because all you're doing that for is for mentoring. And their attributes will develop effectively and saves you one headache in the game. The next thing you want to be careful of, A, you don't want groups to be too big. B, you want to be careful to make sure that good personalities don't get turned by a few bad apples in the group. And this is one such group. Mr. Dennis Geiger, he's lighthearted. This group is not having any effect on him. Instead, he's going to be influencing players in this group. Then we've got Aaron Hickey, who's got an average effect on the group and he's also being influenced by other personalities in this group. So you want to be very careful of placing some of these players. I, for one, would take Dennis Geiger out because, you know, he's just going to turn a few players with his lighthearted jokes. The next player we want to look at is Bogardi. Now, Bogardi has got a very good personality. He's driven, so um, he doesn't need to be in this group. In fact, we don't want him in this group because he's going to be affected by a fairly ambitious, fairly ambitious and a lighthearted personality. Then we've got Amel Belakotchep, highly influential player, hanging around this group. Um, he's having an effect on this group and where we have Aaron Hickey, who's got a very good personality. So let's take him out. Let's not let him be affected by these guys. Now we're down to a bunch of players. Now the question is, whether we want um, our lighthearted personality to be affected. Now, look at this now. Now we've got estimated influence on the group, fairly ambitious, fairly ambitious, resolute, and lighthearted. And the only player who's being affected by this group is Mr. Lighthearted himself. Now we've got this group. So what we can do is we can add a player to this group. Well, I'll just look for some personalities. Uh, we'll just put Klaus Mack in there. And there we go. This unambitious personality is being pummeled by two very strong personalities in this group. And when we go to the final group here, which is the attacking group, once again, we've got a lot of great personalities here. Um, we want to make sure that um, estimated effect from group does not affect the top personality. So we've got 
We've got significant Nikola Ioga, who's a perfectionist. Um, you do not want Mr. Perfectionist, which is one of the nicest personalities to have in the game, being affected by anybody. So you remove him immediately. Then we've got fairly professional, fairly professional, fairly professional. These are also decent personalities. And this, you don't need to tweak this personality at the moment. Spirited, 25. Well, this is a personality that can be influenced. You want him to be influenced by some other personalities. But Spirited isn't that bad. Unambitious, yes, this is definitely a player that we want to see being a mentor. But the estimated effect from this group on him is none, so we might as well take him out. Then we've got uh, Mr. Nan and Nan here, resolute and fairly professional. So these become your mentors and they're mentoring a spirited and fairly professional. So essentially, what we have is a group waiting for youngsters to go in. So all we got to do is come in here. Uh, we've got Mr. Low Self-Belief here. We'll add him. And voila, we've got Mr. Low Self-Belief who now is going to be influenced by a lot of fantastic personalities walking around him. And that's all we have to do to improve mentoring. And you can add other players who have got a problem with, um, you know, confidence. Uh, we've got another player here, Mihai Flore. Um, we've got Miss, yeah, we can add him here. And it, and he has, you know, he loves being in this group. He's, there's a significant influence that this uh, bunch of mentors are going to have on him. So this is one way we can tweak your mentoring groups. Well, and we haven't even gotten to tactics yet, so please keep those middle fingers down. I gotta admit, there's something about your tactic that made me sit up and take notice. And it's got to do with your love of roaming players smack dab in the center. You've got two roaming players here, two Mazalas, which is unique. And you've got three roaming players here. Now, a lot of people out there are just going to go, Oh no, these kind of tactics don't work. I'm the kind of guy that goes, well, if it's worked for you this far, I've got to take a look at some of your highlights. Your lineup against Schalke, you beat them 3-0. I've gone out to highlight the three roles here, Tonali, Zarate and Kamawinga, because all I want to do is watch them move. And you can see Kamawinga is moving forward. Uh, the players are roaming quite well. They're still holding most of the positions correctly. Uh, Zarate doesn't move that now. He starts to move wider because that's what his role is expected to do. Then Kamavinga is here. The players are roaming very nicely and keeping their movement really solid. What I do expect from this system is because of that movement that you're generating, you might struggle against teams that are really fast. And against Liverpool, well, Liverpool created a lot of good chances against you and you struggled in this match. In fact, you lost by a narrow margin 1-0. But the XG alone tells me that there's more to this story. While roaming roles are nice, um, as you can see, the middle is kind of weakened. There's a lot of focus play going on on the left side of the pitch as you try to build up the play. But if you lose the ball, you allow um, space to be exploited by the opposition. So these roaming roles may have been great in the Bundesliga against a lot of other teams. But against Champions League teams uh, who have got lots of potential to give you issues, you may need to consider trying to shore up the center of your midfield. The 4-3-3 is still a bit vulnerable. Um, you have struggled in a few of your matches, so it suggests that maybe a small tweak to the system. We want to maintain that beautiful movement that you've generated, but give you some options when you need to, you know, play a tighter game. Your 4 2 3 one is also a very entertaining system. Plenty of movement in the tactic with the Mazalas going wide and once again, leaving the center open occasionally for some teams. And I think you found out in the Champions League how expensive that could be when you lost to Chelsea in the final. You got all the way to the final and came up against a Chelsea side that was also playing a 4 2 3 one but that porous center gave the game away. This tactic that you use... No amount of great players is going to make it any better. Okay, we're going to highlight the two roles in the middle. These are the two roles. Whenever you go through any kind of a transition, you want to spend time looking at how your players defend. Now, notice this is the wing back. It's pushed forward pretty early in the transition. These players are pretty close to your lines and it's going to be fairly easy for them to break past. The number of passing options they have are very good. Your players are positioned very high up. Any kind of a ball that makes... Uh, this guy, if this player can hold up the ball, that's it. 
You're going to have players running through your lines looking to create chances. And that we go. The wing back comes forward. You got the players now running into the gap, which is over here. Both your uh, central midfielders are woefully trying to catch up. But notice where he's ended up, right? You've got players now all sitting between the channels. And this opens your side up to um, really de poor defensive play. And there we go. The first goal. You know something is very, very wrong with the tactic when you're looking at your own transitions. Here, your goalkeeper has the ball. He's going to try and play it out. He plays it out, gets intercepted, and check out where your defense is versus the attack. Immediately, they get a golden goal. This is a goal that required absolutely no effort from the opposition and they're two up. So just looking at these two highlights alone tell me that there's something seriously wrong with the tactic and that this kind of a tactic, um, while it's okay, it's probably going to score you lots of goals against average opposition. But once you meet the top guys, the top dogs, you're done. So both tactics need some work. Uh, they are okay against... Most of the opposition that you might face, I mean, the creativity, the movement of the ball, yeah, it looks good. But the 4 2 3 1 is a lot more weaker than the 4 3 3. So, what I'm going to do in preseason is come up with two tactics for you a 4 2 3 1 and a 4 3 3 that you can use for your team that's already built for it. By now, you probably noticed something's changed during the course of the show, right? Okay, uh, we're off to. Take a look at how I performed in some of the games I played. We played quite a few. I'm going to skip over the matches where I used um, the iterish, that asymmetric white target man exploiting tactic and focus in on the two tactics that Liam wants to use in his safe. The 4 2 3 1 and the 4 3 3. I am pretty happy with what, how we've done. Uh, we've kept the system relatively solid, scored a fair few goals, uh, beating Wolfsburg by three goals to two. It was, a, it was an interesting match because we fell behind by two goals to nil. And uh, at that point, you might be wondering, do I have to make a tactical change? But honestly, from the get-go, we were doing quite well. We were very unfortunate to concede two really soft goals. At this point in time, the XG was less than one for the opposition. It was something like 0 0.4. So they were very, very lucky to, you know, have taken a two-goal lead. Our XG was well past the one-and-a-half mark at this point when we considered two goals. So I decided to stick to our guns, stay to our system. All I did was substitute two players during the course of the game. And lo and behold, we came back from two down to win this match 3-2. Our next match, a 2-1 win over Bayer Leverkusen, a player that I was... Impressed by was a youngster I put into midfield in our 4-2-3-1, Nicolo Ioga. Our 2-0 win over Veda Bremen, well this was a one-sided affair. Veda Bremen had nothing to offer for 90 minutes of that game. We comfortably won this game by two goals to nil. Our next match was against Atletico Madrid. We used a 4-3-3 DM system at this time. I like the idea sometimes of having a DM in one of my systems. Uh, this allows me to be a bit more defensive against most teams, especially if they are playing like a four, flat four in midfield or even three players in midfield. This gives us a chance to actually use the two central midfielders to man mark specific targets, which is what we did against Atletico Madrid. We kept them at bay, even though it was a tough game for us, we managed to walk away with a one all away draw. We followed that up with a very dominating performance with the 4-3-3, winning the next match by three goals to nil. We didn't have to make a single change to our counter-attacking system against a side that didn't want to come out and play. I'm pretty happy with the way we performed. Um, this is the 4 2 3 1 that we're using now. One thing I want to re uh, reiterate the width, attacking width, can be changed during games, right? So if you want to maintain possession, control matches, you can always drop your attacking width. 
uh, to a narrow standard setting. And then if you want to punch and you want to stretch teams, you can definitely do it with a wider setting. I believe that dribble less is definitely the way to go because you've got so many attacking duties in the final third. So you don't want to be asking any of these players to carry the ball too long. Uh, then it becomes a one-on-one -on -one situation for uh, against most teams. And that's something that we want to avoid. Um, my preferred midfield combination is actually Tonali and this youngster called Nicolo Yoga. The only reason why I like him is because he has so much going for him that he is definitely going to be a player that uh, can stand out in the future. Uh, in front, I, I, I'm i always starting with Robert Skoff because of his uh, free kick ability. Now, in terms of uh, the PIs for this tactic, now, I noticed that you have, in some of your tactics, you have player swapping. I wouldn't recommend this for this tactic. However, if you have a situation where you're faced against a defensive team that doesn't want to come out, then a player will get further, gets forward when all possible is not a bad call for this role. If you are camping for 90 minutes and you find that um, this team doesn't want to, you know, move out of the way. But I find that this tactic can dismantle quite a few teams. Now, this covering defender is pretty much mandatory because we we are we might have a situation where we could lose uh, a bit of control on the left flank. With uh, DLP on support who holds this position, which leaves us with this uh, relatively uh, stable back line. Now, there are no PIs in the system. I minimize the number of PIs that we're going to use in this tactic. Except for right up here, we've got a winger who's crossing him in the center and tackling hard. We've got one guy here marking a specific position. Most of the time, if I'm going to mark a specific position with this player, it's always going to be the DM. We've got an inside forward here. It's also cross same center with tackle harder. And then we've got an AF here. All right. So, okay. So let's, all right. So let's take a quick look at the tactic. Now, the, the TIs are pretty self-explanatory. The TI, are the TIs have not, it's time out to take a look at the 4 2 3 1 that I've designed for you. Now, it's pretty straightforward. We, we want to maintain, I want to maintain most of the other tactic, but I want to keep a more solid center. So, we've got a whole position here, and we've got a roaming playmaker here. So, this guy roams from position, which is the reason why we have this defender on cover. And um, up top, we don't want to use any uh, PIs on this player. And this player, if you want to use a PI like mark specific position, this guy can be, this player can be used to mark defenders. Uh, this is a winger who's been told to cross same center tackle harder along with this player. At the back, there are no PIs on these players as well. So we kept it re relatively simple. Uh, we're doing a low line of engagement, high defensive line. So we want to get players getting stuck in. Um, sometimes you can use tight marking depending on the opposition that you face. If they have better acceleration and technical skills, I would avoid it. Uh, up top, in terms of uh, attacking with, once again, this is situational in matches. You can drop it to narrow or standard like this uh, if you want to keep possession of the ball. And then um, you can move it up wider if you want to unlock size. As far as the other thing, uh, team instructions are concerned, I wouldn't change them, especially dribble less because no, look at this. You've got a whole bunch of players here who are going to dribble quite a lot. You don't need everybody in this area to be dribbling, otherwise you lose the ball. Uh, in terms of possession, we're looking at counter press and hold shape. We distribute quickly from the keeper to the fullbacks. And then uh, the block is a aggressive block, relatively aggressive block here. The 4-3-3, uh, this tactic can be played on balance, cautious, or positive. Now, it's meant to be a relatively compact tactic. Looking at the line of engagement, you've got lower line of engagement, standard defensive line where they use tighter marking, get stuck in, and pressing urgency of uh, more urgent. The idea here is for the players to drop into a compact block so that they can snap teams and hit them on the break, which is the reason why this guy is roaming as a complete forward. Uh, there are no PIs to speak of uh, that are significant for this player. Now, here, for both these players, ideally you want to have cross him to the far post on this fullback because you have an inside forward attacking the space. Now, on the left flank, we didn't put a cross him instruction because this player is, is going to be hanging about most of the time he's going to try and help you build up players the fullbacks go surging past him uh there's an underlap right which is aim, which is aiming to you know get passes into these two players here uh from any any one of these players like maybe the fullback on attack or the inverted winger uh as far as pis are concerned we've got mark specific player now here the mark specific player occasionally might be on the defender right so if you want to mark anybody you use these guys to man mark the defenders now there are going to be times when you want to take this off 
Because if you want to really play an aggressively defensive game against teams like um, Atletico Madrid, then I take I recommend taking the mark specific playoff instead using mark specific play with these players. So these players are the ones that are marking the central defenders and removing them as options. Because don't forget, you have very tall, you have some very good defenders. Not him. <laughs> There's another defender here that's got jumping ratio about 18. So you can use uh, the two defenders here. So the idea here is you put pressure on their central midfield, forcing them to go wide, looking for passing opportunities. When that fails, right, their central, the you know, the idea here is pretty simple. You want to use man marking right, on their central midfielders, taking their midfielders out as easy passing options, forcing them to go right. The idea here is these two players are man marked the center, removing them as easy passing options, forcing sides to go to the flanks and, you know, putting in crosses. And you've got defenders who can deal with them. They're all very tall, so you shouldn't have an issue. Most of your defenders are pretty good at reading the game. So that's the reason why um, I prefer using these two to do the man marking in most cases, right? because they will remove the passing options, forcing teams to actually go wide uh, as a natural passing option. And you don't go and you're playing on standard defensive with here. So this means that there is a possibility that your players are going to start marking them, and which which will happen. Um, we, as far as uh, the other PIs are concerned, uh, there are no other PIs except for cross aim far post again here. No cross aim here. The wall playing defenders aren't doing anything special. Distribute the fullbacks, counter press counter. Uh, that's because you probably, if you have the ball in the attacking, you probably high up the pitch. Remember, we're, we're basically you know trying to hit teams on the break. Focus play through the middle with only an underlap. We don't want to do one on the left flank because uh, this will make it too attacking. Right? So this is already fairly aggressive on the left flank. With some aggressive roles at the inside forward is already on an attacking mentality. Right? And uh, on balance. So we don't want to go out there and start creating a situation where we've got players uh, that are on different mentalities. So you notice your team mentality is balanced, but you've got a fullback who's positive. You've got uh, two attacking mentalities here. So... That's the reason why we want to make sure that this register is always somebody who has got very good defensive position and can tackle. So, it's been a lot of fun. I particularly enjoyed this episode of Game Changer because it gave me a chance to do a live stream with it for once. It was a lot of fun. And I'm looking forward to hearing from you very, very soon. So, let me know how your save gets along and if you have any further questions, please look me up. Once again, I want to thank everybody for joining me on today's show. I hope you found it useful. And uh, I look forward to catching up with you. Don't forget, I live stream Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays on a slightly different channel right now. So check out the link in the description of the video. Go to that channel and subscribe to my uh, channel and stay in touch. I'll see you again soon. You guys take care. Have a good one. Bye-bye.